We've got a packed house. About seven or eight hundred people in here. Good evening. I'm Joe Nye, Dean of the Kennedy School of Government, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the ARCO Forum and to the Albert H. Gordon Lecture on Finance and Public Policy. The Gordon Lectures are a long tradition here at the Kennedy School, and the list of distinguished lecturers includes Richard Darman, who is now teaching at the Kennedy School, and former Secretary of State Jim Baker, former Senator Robert Dole, and last year's lecturer, President George Bush. It's a particular honor to welcome President Gerald Ford, who is also the Heffernan Visiting Fellow at the Institute of Politics this year, to be the Gordon Lecturer. Alan Simpson will be doing the formal introduction, but I want to say now that President Ford is an exemplar of a noble tradition in American politics that we consider the vital center. And I think all of us who watched his career in American politics feel that this country holds him close to their hearts. I want to take a moment to acknowledge the distinguished member of the audience tonight. And that man sitting in the front row is Albert H. Gordon. Al Gordon earned his bachelor's degree at Harvard in 1923, as well as an MBA two years later. And he generously created the lecture that we have tonight. Al Gordon has been a member of the Harvard Board of Overseers but my favorite bit of biographical information about Al Gordon, which is so good that I never tire of repeating it, is that he was running marathons well into his 80s. And now to welcome President Ford to Harvard and the Kennedy School, I'd like to welcome another Al, Al Simpson, who for two decades was the US Senator from Wyoming, and is now Director of the Institute of Politics, and by repute, the most popular man in the Kennedy School. <laughs> By repute, hmm, I've not heard that. <laughs> repute, I'll have to think about that. Well, Joe, thank you very much. This, this is a rare honor and privilege for me. I first met this man on the main street of Cody, Wyoming. My hometown, the Athens of the West, you know. <laughs> My dad was uh, governor of Wyoming, uh, and it was uh, summer of uh, 57. And down the street comes Jerry Ford and Keith Thompson, who was a wonderful young congressman from Wyoming. I realized they were in their early 40s. I was very young. <laughs> and uh, they took me in. They took me into some places that day that I had never been in. No. <laughs> uh, it was not the log cabin bar and lounge, but it was close by. And anyway, Keith Thompson and, and Jerry Ford were very good friends. Uh, he left us all too soon, a uh, wonderful man. They were two very vital people, and I thought, boy, you know, there's two politicians. There they were. I said, I think this is something I could look at. So uh, Jerry had come back to, to the place of his roots, which was Wyoming. His father lived in Riverton, Wyoming. Uh, and uh, and uh, Jerry loved my native state. He had a summer job as a ranger in Yellowstone Park and uh, got hooked, hooked like a rainbow trout on Wyoming. Came back uh, to see the place of his roots and then of course uh, this remarkable career. Born in Omaha, Nebraska, the family soon moved to Grand Rapids, Michigan. He started on the University of Michigan football team uh, went on to Yale, please. No, <laughs> no reaction there. Where he served as an assistant football coach while also earning a law degree at the same time he was involved as assistant coach. He rose to the rank of lieutenant commander in the Navy during World War II. He was first elected to the Congress in 1948. He served in Congress two years with Dave Pryor, one of our fellows here. 
That was the same year he married Elizabeth Betty Bloomer. He was a man known for his honesty and his openness and his integrity with his peers, his colleagues. And they chose him as the House Minority Leader for 10 years, from 1963 to 73. His reputation then made him the clear choice for Vice President under President Nixon. And he was the first Vice President chosen under the terms of the 25th Amendment. Uh, as President, uh, Gerald Ford showed a, a tremendous courage by pardoning Richard Nixon. Had that not been done, this country would have been in turmoil. It was in turmoil. And this man that is with us tonight settled this country down because of his integrity. And if you have integrity, nothing else matters. And if you don't have integrity, nothing else matters. <laughs> and uh, so he did that. And then, of course, uh, his chief of staff uh, for a time as president was a young man from Wyoming named Dick Cheney, and Dick and I served together. He was my sidekick for 10 years. So it goes way back. And Dick Cheney uh, uh, was a wonderful congressperson, secretary of defense. But during his first 14 months in office, Gerald Ford uh, did 39 vetoes on bills he thought would take us into an inflationary spiral that would be tough to beat. He was known as Captain Veto, armed with a pen. In foreign affairs, he brokered an interim truce agreement between Israel and Egypt. He also reached new limits on nuclear weapons with the Soviet Union. He has helped me along in public life with immigration issues, campaign reform. He was always there for me in many ways. Loyal, sincere, caring. And he always put the interests of his country, always, before, before his own, through thick or thin you would want him on your side. So President Jerry Ford, you grace us with your presence. Uh, it's a singular honor to introduce the 38th President of the United States of America, Gerald Ford. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you didn't overdo. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. Won't you all sit down, please? Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please. <clears throat> Thank you. Won't you all sit down, please? Thank you. No, no. Please sit down. Uh, thank you very, very much, Alan. Um, and thank all of you for your very warm and much too generous uh, reaction. Before getting into my prepared comments, let me express my deep gratitude and appreciation for the number of former members of my administration who are here. I don't want to start listing them because I'll obviously forget one. So I can only say there are five or maybe 10 here. <laughs> and I can say without any hesitation or qualification, whatever good the Ford administration did in the two and a half years that I was in the White House. They were the ones that brought about our success. So I thank them, each and every one of them, for their service and their help. <clears throat> I thank Al for his uh, much too kind and far too generous introduction. It, reminds me uh, of a different kind of comment that I ordinarily get from my golfing partner, Bob Hope. Uh, let me illustrate. Bob and I were playing in the Dinah Shore Pro-Am one time out in California, and uh, there was a huge crowd at the first tee waiting to see Bob tee off. And as he put the ball down, some very nice lady in the audience said, Bob, what's your favorite foursome? And Bob looked around at the lady in the crowd and said, my favorite foursome? Jerry Ford, a faith healer, and a paramedic. <laughs> as uh, Alan, as director of the Institute of Politics, you've rather reversed the career path followed by Woodrow Wilson, who left Princeton 
to become governor of the state of New Jersey. One of Wilson's very, very favorite stories concerned two working men who heard Wilson speak at a campaign rally in Newark. The comment was, that's a smart guy, one of the workmen said. Smart as hell, said the other. What I don't see is what a fellow as smart as that doing hanging around a college so long. <laughs> if anyone wonders where Al Simpson is smart as hell, he'll only have to check out his post-senatorial priorities. As for my own life in Washington, I have never forgotten something Herbert Hoover said on one occasion to an admirer who approached him following the 1957 dedication of the Harry Truman Presidential Library in Independence, Missouri, asked how former presidents occupied their days. Hoover replied, and I quote, we spend our time taking pills and dedicating libraries. <laughs> it wasn't true then, and it even less so today. Take it from one whose privilege it has been to visit nearly 200 college and university campuses since leaving Washington, D.C. 20-some years ago. Let me say without reservation, each one of those experiences has been a great, great learning experience for me. Maybe not for the audiences, but for me it was a tremendous benefit. This evening conjures some very special memories, for it was exactly 50 years ago that I first arrived at the nation's capital as the lowest ranking creature in the political food chain, <laughs> a minority freshman congressman. As such, I was assigned to uh, an office equivalent to Peabody Terrace. <laughs> it just so happened that across the hall from me in the old house office building was a second term representative from the great state of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. His name was Jack Kennedy. We came from vastly different backgrounds, and more than not, especially on domestic issues, our votes canceled each other out. But we very frequently walked to the House floor together, and in the course of those long rambles, and it's a pretty good hike, we developed a very warm and close friendship that transcended political differences. Little could I then imagine that terrible day in November 1963 when the torch handed to our generation just two and a half years early was violently wrenched from Jack's hands. Still less could I conceive that the new president following President Kennedy would ask me to serve on the Warren Commission that investigated the death of my very dear friend and colleague. Today, more than 35 years later, Harvard's favorite son reminds us all of a time when Americans took heart from their leaders and hope from the political process. How proud Jack Kennedy would be of this school. May I also tip my hat to Al Gordon, for whom this lecture series is named, and who, at the age of 97, honors us with his presence here tonight. Al, you're an inspiration to all octogenarians. I <laughs> congratulate you. My original intent was to address the role of the American presidency in business and economic development. 
it's an important subject. But with your permission, I would like to broaden the focus just a bit to offer some perspective on what has been called the American century and some uniquely American values of a sort that no economist can measure. You might say that I have a special interest in this century if only because I've experienced so much of it. Woodrow Wilson and I go back a long ways. You see, Wilson was inaugurated president of the United States just a few months before I was born in July of 1913. Come to think of it, Al, you may have been there. <laughs> the day before his inauguration, the record shows that thousands of suffragettes marched up Pennsylvania Avenue carrying banners that read, tell your troubles to Woodrow. You can imagine, I can, where my wife Betty would have been in 1913. <laughs> she still campaigns to eliminate wage discrimination between men and women. It was a time of rapid change for Americans as government expanded in proportion to industrial growth and social inequities. Henry Ford invented the modern assembly line in 1913. The Constitution was amended to authorize the first personal income tax and the direct election of the senators from each state. Massachusetts passed the nation's first minimum wage law the Buffalo Nickel made its debut. So did the Federal Reserve System, created to give Washington a measure of control over what had become the world's largest economy. It's not without irony that Woodrow Wilson called his program the new freedom. For what he envisioned as a return to market competition, assured through the new Federal Trade Commission and other watchdog agencies, soon fell victim to the law of unintended consequences, law seemingly prevalent throughout this often lawless century. For it was also in 1913 that President Wilson declared in a speech in Mobile, Alabama, that the United States, quote, will never seek one additional territory by conquest, end quote. I was all of five years old in November 1918 when my neighbors in Grand Rapids, Michigan took to the streets to celebrate the armistice that put an end, or so we thought, to America's involvement in foreign wars. It turned out that we were somewhat premature, for the Peace of Versailles proved to be provisional at best. Meanwhile, war overseas transformed the domestic economy. Woodrow Wilson, advocate of the new freedom, found himself sitting, setting, I should say, the price of sugar and dictating the size of baby carriages. The same government that ran the nation's railroad determined the location of new factories, also decreed an end to bronze caskets and wheat on Wednesday. All this foreshadowed even greater centralization of authority undertaken in response to the Great Depression and World War II. The welfare state more or less improvised by Franklin Roosevelt, would be complemented, if that is a word we use, by the security state, wherein risk is minimized and market forces repealed. Conservatives took note and didn't much care for what they saw. Dwight Eisenhower put it best when he said, quote, if the only thing the American people are interested in is security, they can go to jail. 
for security can all too easily lead to complacency, that intellectual narcotic which muffles the voice of originality and numbs the brain to innovation. Now don't get me wrong, security and the search for it can produce notable byproducts. Certainly it provides a goal more elevated than profit all by itself. Certainly it uh, flourishes most in a society supported of incentive and profit alike, as Albert Gordon has so richly demonstrated through his own remarkable life. It is those individuals who take risks and challenge the status quo who create our jobs and set our standards. Such entrepreneurs come in many colors. They adhere to many creeds. They live in every city and every state. They worship in diverse churches, synagogues, mosques. They vote for various candidates. But this much they have in common. Even in times of difficulty, times when the fault lines of our society are exposed with brutal realism, they look at problems and discern possibilities. They do not fear change. Indeed, they court it as a natural ally. Because they understand the past, they do not shrink from the future. I know whereof I speak. In the course of almost 86 years, I've seen more than my share of miracles. I've witnessed the defeat of Nazi tyranny, the destruction of the evil empire, at home, we passed civil rights laws, tearing down old barriers of human potential. We have at long last recognized and rewarded women for their wonderful contributions. We have celebrated the end of polio, cheered as Americans left their footprints on the moon, and scratched our heads over the birth of information. Like millions of people who can't tell the difference between a gigabyte and a happy meal, I am optimist by nature. I grew up in a household where three rules governed, and I mean governed. Work hard, tell the truth, and be on time for dinner. It's not a very sophisticated philosophy, but it's gotten me through some tight spots. <laughs> There's something else I learned from my early age, something I would heartily recommend to anyone who contemplates a life in politics. I learned that most people are mostly good most of the time. I learned that an adversary is not the same thing as an enemy. I learned to fight hard for my beliefs without questioning the motives or patriotism of those who believed otherwise. Thus I come before you this evening not to bury political moderation, but to praise it. One way or another, my generation has paid a very heavy price in resistance to the century's extremists, to the dictators, the utopians, to social engineers who condemn the human race for all being too human. As a young man pursuing a law degree at that other college down in New Haven, I emulated the isolationist outlook of my fellow Midwesterners before the war. Actually, it took the Second World War and the example of my hometown hero, Senator Arthur Vandenberg, to make me realize that isolationism was an uh, unaffordable luxury in the modern world. On a combat aircraft carrier in the Pacific, I learned that leadership carries with it a price, a price measured in the 20th century 
by eternal vigilance against those who would put the soul itself in bondage. This was a big idea, big enough to make me take on an entrenched isolationist congressman in the 1948 Republican primary. He believed the world ended around the Michigan-Indiana border. I thought it extended as far as uh, Berlin and Beijing. The voters agreed with me. Consequently, a few months later, I was ushered into the Oval Office for the first time to hear an American president outline a bipartisan foreign policy worthy of America at its most generous. The Marshall Plan, Greek Turkish aid, on and on under President Truman. As it happened, Harry Truman was the first of eight presidents backed by 20 congressmen, congressmen, or congressmen, congress, I say, of both parties who maintained a policy of constructive engagement in what John F. Kennedy would call our long twilight struggle. It is fashionable these days to say that with the collapse of communism, conservatives have lost their individual or intellectual bonding. I disagree. I have always believed that the greatness of America is to be found in the freedom of her people, not the power of its government. Yet even as we meet, some Americans who style themselves political conservatives are declaring that politics has failed, that our culture is, to quote one despairing source, quote, an ever-widening sewer, end quote, and that the future is no longer our friend. According to the pessimists, the only course open to principled people, and men and women, is withdrawal. Withdrawal from the public schools, from the courts, from political engagement itself. I couldn't disagree more. No doubt, much of this despondency, despondency on the right, is grounded in the refusal of Congress to remove President Clinton from office. With all due respect, this seems to me a fundamental misreading of popular attitudes. I think it profoundly underestimates both the common sense and fair play of the American people, most of whom are perfectly willing to entrust the Clinton presidency to historians. What's more, the early strength shown by such potential candidates as George W. Bush and Elizabeth Dole suggests that voters are looking for a very different kind of a president in the year 2000. In any event, those who would blame the American people for the outcome of the Senate trial might do well to remember their ideological opposites on the left who were forever denouncing their countrymen for supporting Ronald Reagan and a Republican Congress. Adopting an attitude of moral superiority is unlikely to win the allegiance of voters for whom tolerance is a virtue and who would be just as happy to have politicians stay out of their wallet, out of their classrooms, out of their bedrooms, and out of their boardrooms. Fortunately, those who combine strong principles with a taste for moder political moderation needn't look very far to find a role model. At the dawn of this century, Another Harvard man transformed his party as he reinvented the presidency. Theodore Roosevelt understood that unregulated monopoly could pose an even greater threat than unrestrained government, not least because it encouraged 
radical tendencies, among others, who were exploited by predatory wealth. Everywhere his countrymen looked in the first years of the new century, they saw a dynamic leader for whom breaking with tradition was a tradition. For example, inviting a black man, Booker T. Washington, to dine in the White House, assailing the vast conglomerates called trusts, bringing under government watchful eye the production of meat, food, and drugs, setting aside vast areas unspoiled west for generations yet unborn. To the average American, T.R. was easily the most captivating Democratic chief executive since Lincoln. Yet at heart, he was a thoughtful conservative, a pragmatic product of Manhattan's elegant brownstone who balanced budgets and threw open the windows of a musty society to forestall more violent change. He serves his party best, Roosevelt said, who helps to make it instantly responsible to every need of the people. Much like Dwight Eisenhower, a very bona fide fiscal conservative, would construct the interstate highway system because the old soldier understood that building roads was more economically efficient and beneficial than making missiles. Richard Nixon created the Environmental Protection Agency in no small measure because he knew that despoiling nature was a perversion of freedom. And Ronald Reagan, recognizing the ancient desire for security, stunned more conventional thinkers by proposing the Strategic Defense Initiative. Instead of industrial policy imposed from above or in the siren song of protectionism, Presidents Reagan and Bush offered us the North American tre uh, Free Trade Agreement, confident that Americans could win any peaceful competition. Here's what I call conservative, creative conservatism, as old as Alexander Hamilton's fiscal nationalism and as current as the debate over social security. As we meet, there appears to be a broad consensus on setting aside the bulk of a projected federal budget to assure that long-term health of Social Security is preserved, privatizing at least part of the current system would empower today's young people with a greater control over their economic destiny. But it makes all the difference in the world whether you are the wage earner to get your earnings or whether Uncle Sam does it for you. It's, it is quite simply. The difference between privatization and paternalism, one, one approach trusts you to make your own choice with your own money. The other reserves the right of Washington's bureaucrats. This is, in my judgment, a defining test of whether, in fact, the era of big government is over. It is just one of the many issues that will demand grassroots activism as well as classroom expertise. In a culture where more people recognize Oprah than the Speaker of the House, it is easy to say that politics have been crowded out of our lives by forms of mass entertainment. The problem with that theory is Oprah doesn't set your taxes or run your schools or commit young Americans to foreign wars. For my own part, I readily admit to a bias in favor of two political parties. To me, our 
Political parties are instruments of government more than vehicles of protest. First, they define our differences, then they mediate them. In the process, they serve as a kind of ideological shock absorber, cushioning the impact of change and forging a consensus acceptable to the vast majority of people who travel the middle row. Unfortunately, there are some on the right and some on the left for whom consensus is a dirty word. Mistaking the clash of ideas with a holy war, they forget that while righteousness may win you a place in heaven, self-righteousness is unlikely to win you the White House. At heart, most Americans are pragmatists. We want to make things work. We value authenticity as much as ideologically, especially in the age when so much of what passes for public life consists of little more than candidates without ideas, hiring consultants without convictions, to stage campaigns without content. Increasingly, the result is elections without voters. <clears throat> if there is cynicism, and there is, Perhaps it is because so much jockeying for partisan advantage at the expense of public policy. 200 years ago, our first president summed up the glory and the frustration of American politics when he said, and I'll quote, a democratic state must feel before it can see, and that is what makes it slow to action. But the people at last will be right, end quote. Whatever troubles may plague the city named for George Washington, they can be resolved as long as we place our ultimate trust in the people and as long as we, the people, demand less of Washington and more of ourselves. A statement that has always been a favorite of mine in talking to some of my constituents in Michigan for 25 and a half years, a government big enough to give us everything we want is a government big enough to take from us everything we have. Wherever I go these days, I sense a longing for community and a desire on the part of citizens of all ages to be part of something bigger and nobler than themselves. This attitude is especially strong among you, the younger generation. History tells us that it is only a matter of time before your generation is to be tested. Just as mine was tested by economic depression, foreign tyranny, and the hateful regime of Jim Crow. Outwardly, your America may not look the same as mine. New technologies and in industries, new forms of communication and medical breakthroughs promise to expand the frontiers of life in years to come. But amidst all this New, may I suggest that you never lose faith in an America that is bolder, better, and fairer with each passing generation. The bigger the issue, the greater the need for your active involvement. It was true when I entered politics as an advocate of America's global obligations half a century ago. It was true when John F. Kennedy summoned his countrymen to meet the test of the Cold War stewardship. It is just as dead for the 
today's young Americans who will be called upon to reform entitlement programs and make Washington more than a soundbite factory, even while transmitting Jefferson's self-evident truths to the next American century. So I leave you then with a challenge worthy of your talents to assure that our differences are pursued with civility as well as convention, and that tomorrow's politi politicians are seen as something more than puppets on a string, dancing to the music of the spinmeisters. In the words of Judge Leonard Hand, I quote, even a skeptic like me must believe that it is always dawn, that day breaks forever and above the eastern horizon. Somewhere at this very, very moment, the sun is about to peep. And all one needs is just the little crack of possibility. My fondest hope is that each of you will make your own individual contribution to a nation that welcomes your gift and your return to idealism. For then you will have realized the promise of this extraordinary school. You will have helped to ensure that it's always dawn and a crack of possibility. God bless you all. I'll recognize them for you, and we'll just go around those comments. President Ford has agreed to take a few questions. I will remind you that questions are short, end with a question mark, and they come one per customer. <laughs> and I'll also ask you to please identify yourself as you ask your question. We'll start with this mic. Hello, my name is Preston Golson, and I'm a freshman at Harvard College. Uh, in recent years, Congress, especially the House, has suffered much criticism for being too partisan. Uh, from your experience in the House, what can be done to improve this current situation? <clears throat> I've been asked that question, uh, as you can imagine, more than once. And I wish I had a simple, straightforward answer where I could turn a switch and tell all the 435 members in the House and the 100 in the Senate how to uh, behave and be civil and get the work done. But I in all honesty, cannot give you a particular answer. Uh, I can only suggest to some of the current members that uh, if they go back and read some of the previous debate 30 years ago, or hear from those who were there then, it uh, would be a good start. Uh, I had many adversaries in the Congress, but I had no enemies. Today, I have a very distinct feeling that the partisanship has developed into a, almost a bitterness that uh, is irreconcilable. But I'm always an optimist that you'll find new leaders coming along who hopefully will convince their colleagues that you solve problems by working at it, not by yelling at one another. Thank you. Yes.
Well, neither episode was one of the better periods in American history. <laughs> uh, I deeply regretted the experiences that we went through with Watergate. Uh, it was a very unhappy period of time, not only for people like myself, but it was an unhappy time for the American people. And inexcusable, intolerable. Uh, the current situation, uh, as I said in my remarks, I'll let historians pass judgment. Uh, during the process of how the House and Senate were trying to decide what action they were going to take, if any, I wrote an op-ed piece for the New York Times uh, in October which said if they would act quickly and have censure, it would resolve the matter satisfactorily and they could get on with their legislative responsibility. Uh, they did not respond and then in December, former President Carter and I wrote a, a joint op-ed piece for the New York Times that amplified what I had said, but uh, the people in control of the situation in the Congress uh, ignored that recommendation. So. Uh, I think it's a little early other than to say uh, it was not a good period, uh, just as Watergate was not a good period in our history. Go to the left side of the balcony. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. President. I'm Gotham McCundell. I'm a sophomore at the college. I know you can't see me. <laughs> First, let me uh, thank you for honoring us with your presence today. You spoke of the crafting of a bipartisan foreign policy and the construction of the Marshall Plan. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts on how, when a level of distrust in Washington exists to the extent that the president is charged with using military action as political cover, how you feel it's possible for the next administration to continue in that trend and craft a bipartisan foreign policy to deal with the collapse of Russia, the rise of Chinese power, and so on, other world situations? I have never been one to allege that the present administration has used military action to divert public attention from some other uh, problem that was on the steps of the White House. Uh, we have serious military commitments on a worldwide basis, and I have always been one who believed that we had to act. Uh, one of the first votes I made in Congress was supporting Harry Truman in the Korean War. And as I said earlier, I supported him on the Marshall Plan, Greek-Turkish aid, et cetera. Uh, but as I see the situation today, let me go back 10 years ago before the collapse of the Soviet Union. At that time, the United States was spending about $400 billion a year on the Defense Department. We had uh, the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines with ample air wings, ample divisions, ample ships, etc. With the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989 or 90, uh, we immediately said we're going to save all this money because we don't have the Cold War. So we cut our spending from $400 billion a year down to about $300 billion. We slashed Army division, cut back ships, uh, we reduced air wings, et cetera. But at the same time, we continued 40,000 troops in South Korea. We continued to have significant forces in Japan. We added forces in Bosnia and uh, about, I think, five to 7,000. We're talking about sending four to 6,000 to Kosovo. What worries me as we reduce the size and the capability of our Defense Department, we're adding military uh, commitments that I think could put our overall national interest in some jeopardy. So all I can say is I hope whatever the military decisions are, they're predicated on what is in our national interest, not for any other uh, sideline reason or justification. Right side. 
Uh, good evening, Mr. President. My name is Shankar Daraswamy. I'm a freshman at the college. The tendency of modern conservatism is to frame big government as an institution that's sort of opposed to individual liberty and is opposed to our needs and desires. Uh, yet at the same time, we lament a lack of political participation and we lament the fact that Americans are generally cynical of their government. If we continue to frame big government as an institution that's opposed to individual liberty, is it possible to instill a sense of civic virtue in American citizens? And is it possible to convince them that indeed America is a democracy where self-government rules? Well, I'm always an optimist. And although we've had our share of disappointments in uh, uh, times when things were going very well, uh, we are going through a difficult period today. The Congress doesn't operate the way I think it should or has in the past. Certainly the uh, situation in the executive branch is uh, not up to the standards of our tradition. Uh, we've got lots of problems, but I happen to believe very strongly that because of our form of government, because of the basic good of the a majority of the American people, we're going to come out of this. And I'm not going to uh, side with the cynics and the skeptics and the pessimists. I feel good about America, despite our president dif present difficulties. Thank you so much for speaking with us this evening. Uh, my name is Erin Ashwell. I'm a freshman at the college. And I wanted to ask you about the upcoming election. We have two sort of interesting political philosophies coming up, um, pragmatic liberalism and compassionate conservatism. Where do you see them falling in relation to the past philosophies and the type? Do you see that falling into the search for moderation that you've called for? Well, I condemned my Democratic friends who were way over on the left, and I equally disassociate myself from my Republican allies who were way over on the right. I happen to believe the American people basically are in the center. Uh, and I think a president, presidential candidate in 19, the year 2000 who's going to win is going to believe in and uh, advocate publicly a, a position on various issues that is in the middle or moderate. Uh, uh, my good Democratic friends uh, over in three elections had good people, Mondale, Dukakis, and uh, one other, uh, who were, I would say, left or liberal. And the Republicans occupied the center, and we won uh, with Reagan, with Bush, and uh, we made a mistake. Uh, we moved to the extreme right, or it appeared we had. The Democrats won. And I think uh, they learned the lesson. If we're going to win, we'll have to learn the lesson. And uh, you can be uh, I happen to think uh, a compassionate conservative, and uh, uh, it's a good phrase to start your campaign with. <laughs> Thanks. Mr. President, I'm John Jordan, a student here at the Kennedy School. Thank you. Do you believe that the emergent technologies are hindering our ability to achieve community, or um, can that be turned around? I think it's a mistake to take the position that emerging technologies drive us apart. It ought to be looked upon as a coalescent of people. Uh, and I, I just admire tremendously the people who are so innovative, so visionary that we come up with all of these wonderful new inventions, etc. I admire them and envy them. 
I don't think they're driving me from them as long as they're willing to share the blessings or the benefits of what they produce. And to start driving a wedge between us, I think, is a bad mistake. Balcony? No, all right, we'll go down here and on the right side. Okay, thank you, uh, President Ford. Uh, my name is John Paul Rollard. I'm a junior at Harvard College, and I'm very proud to say a native of Grand Rapids myself. Congratulations. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm interested to hear what you think the most important issue that should animate debate um, for the 2000 presidential race should be. What is the most? What, what should be the most important issue that should animate the debate for the 2000 presidential race? I don't like to isolate one. I'd rather take uh, one in the area of foreign policy and one in the way of domestic policy. I'm proud of the fact that the um, uh, Congress and the White House have gotten together to produce a balanced budget. I struggled on the Committee on Appropriations for 14 years, among many others, trying to achieve that. And that uh, should be a, our continued goal in fiscal policy, and it is required to achieve the cooperation of the White House and the Congress. Uh, I happen to believe that that fiscal policy we've had for the last three years, uh, combined with the actions of the White House and the Congress, has been a major factor in our economic prosperity for the last few years. In combination with the leadership of Alan Greenspan over at the Fed, if there's one person who deserves that credit, I would say Alan. But we've got to preserve or to continue our economic prosperity, which I think is remarkable. We're in our eighth or ninth year. So that ought to be an issue in the next campaign. Foreign policy-wise, uh, we no longer have the Cold War. The Berlin Wall doesn't exist. Uh, but with the collapse of the Soviet Union, we automatically, as the only surviving superpower, now have a responsibility to give leadership. We can't police every incident that happens around the globe, but we should have a capability and a willingness where it involves major potential conflagration to give our military support and assistance. Uh, protectionism is an evil influence in this country. Isolationism would be equally bad. So in foreign policy, I hope the next election will be emphasis on our world leadership in internationalism and our opposition to protectionism. This will have to be the last question. Good evening, sir, and thank you again for coming. My name is Jacqueline Newmeyer, and I'm a sophomore at the college. I was wondering if you're concerned that the increased scrutiny on the private lives of our elected officials and our national leaders is discouraging promising career public servants from pursuing higher office. I'm certain there are people who would be excellent candidates and office holders who are hesitant to get into the political arena with the expectation that their private lives over their full lifetime will be exposed to the press. And because they don't want that to be in the newspaper or on the tube, just won't get into the political fray. That's sad, terrible. Uh, but. Uh, I think we'll have an adequate number of good candidates. They'll just have to uh, gamble that whatever they've done, they didn't or di <laughs> didn't want exposed. They'll have to live with it. But uh, there will be people who will take the gamble, and I think we'll have enough good candidates and. Um, I certainly hope and trust that's true. Thank you. Well, uh, we have tried your patience and uh, benefited from your wisdom.
please all join me in thanking President Ford for proving there is a vital center in American politics. That was really very good.